what a blind man saw. We'll be reading from Acts chapter 9 this morning, verses 1 through 18 initially. While blind, Saul saw six things that we should see today. To set the stage, we'll, we'll read this, these first few chapters of Acts chapter 9. But Saul, still threatening, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters to the, to the synagogues in Damascus so that he, if he found any along the way, men or women, he might bring, bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice, said to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter into the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he saw nothing. And so they led him by hand and brought him to Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, neither ate nor drank, and there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, go, and he, and he said, Ananias, and he said, here am I, Lord, and he said, arise and go to the street called Straight, to the house of Judas, for a, and look for a man of of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he's praying. And he, seen, and he had seen in a vision a man named Ananias come and lay hands on him so that he may regain his sight. But Ananias answered and said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And there he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on him in your name. And the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, and, I'll, and I will show him much. he must suffer much for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and went to the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road from which you came, has sent me so you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. It's a privilege to be able to bring a lesson to you all this morning, and it's a blessing to be here with you in person and well of those that join us online. We want to look this morning at six things that Saul learned or saw while he was blind. The first thing we look at is that conscience is not a safe guide in religion. In religion, too many let their conscience be their guide. Conscience is a good thing. Our conscience is a good thing. It's that inner voice that tells us whether we're doing the right thing or not. And it's usually based upon what we've been taught, told, or believed. I think of a good example about how conscience works in my life. My, my father was a preacher. He had five kids. I had two brothers and two sisters. And we fought all the time. And one of the things that I learned early on is you never hit a girl. And that was, that was something that's buried deep in my conscience. And, and now, if my mother had an odd way of, by some, of dealing with these kids, if w us boys, we started to get into a fight, words were exchanged, the war's coming, the battle's coming. She said to us, if you guys are going to fight, go out in the yard and fight. She didn't want us to tear up anything in the house, so we'd go out there and beat on each other until we settled our differences or we, and you couldn't come in complaining about anything. She said, go outside. But we never could do that to the girls. We never could hit a girl. And that's just buried deep inside me even today. I mean, you're just not going to do it. We have to think of other ways to get even with those girls. But, <laughs> but never hit them. That's sort of how our conscience worked. Saul says later, 
as we study today, we're going to look at, we, we're gonna, we've just read his conversion experience, and he even talks about it in the writings that he's give, in, given in the letters, and when he retells the story, he talks about it. We're going to look at some of the things that he said about that to see the things that he learned, the things that he saw when he was blind. And the one, first one was that conscience is not a safe guide in religion. Paul said in, in Acts 23 and 1, and he looked at the council, he said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience to this day. So he's now looking back even on the terrible things that he did, but he said, I lived in a good conscience to God. But he, even so, he did many things that were wrong. In retelling this, he, in Acts 26 and 9, he said, I myself was convinced that I might do many things opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So Paul was confident, his, his conscience was clear when he was persecuting the Christians, when he bound them to carry them back, to, for them to be tr tried. And you remember he was at the, stood at, when Stephen was uh, being stoned and held the garments, watched the garments of those people. And he thought at that time that that's what should be going on. And he thought at that time, his conscience told him that it was okay even to see someone put to death. It's amazing that our conscience can lead us astray. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, its way is death. Paul learned that his conscience was not a good guide in religious matters. He also saw that being a religious person is not enough. Certainly, Paul, Saul at the time, was a very, very religious person man. Some think today that as long as you're good and sincere and have a good heart, that you will be pleasing to God. Those things are necessary, but that can't be the only thing. Saul of Tarsus, as we said, was very religious, very zealous. In Galatians 1 and 13, he said, you've heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. He persecuted Christians religiously. In Acts 26 and 5, he said, They've known for a long time, that they're will and if they're willing to testify, that I was according to the strictest party of our religion. So, he was... He was known as being one of the strictest of the strict. Despite... His sincerity, his devotion, his dedication. He even would, might be said he was very conservative. He was also very wrong. So he saw that being a religious person was not enough. He also saw that he could transgress by following men's tradition or men, men's teaching. We talked some about this in our Bible class this morning. Many today blindly follow the traditions handed down to them. And you say, how can you say that? When they see what's taught in the scriptures, do they always, have you heard this? Well, I've always heard, or I've always been taught, or I always thought, or my mother, or my father, this or that. And when they see the scriptures and if they believe something differently, then they'll use that and you know that they're following traditions, let's call it, that are handed down to them. In Galatians 1 and 14, Paul said, I was advancing Judaism beyond my own age among my people, so extremely zealous I was for the traditions of the fathers. And of course, those were Jewish traditions. Even Jesus talked about the fallacy of that in Matthew 15, verses 1 through 9. We'll read that. Matthew 15, 1 through 9. Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat. And he said unto them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and mother, and whosoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If, I, if someone tells his father or mother, what would you have gained from me was given to the Lord. You know, they would rather than take care of their aged parents, 
they would say, well, that money that I would spend on you is committed to the temple or committed to God, and I can't spend any money on you, Mom and Dad. And that's the way they worked their way around that, as they did with all of their traditions. In verse 7, he says, You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lip, but their heart is far from me. And he concluded in Matthew 15 and 9, saying, In vain do they worship for me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And we also know even in today, Paul saw this and understood this, but we too must be careful that we are looking to God's word for all that we do and let that be our guide. The only teaching and doctrine that we follow comes from God through the Holy Spirit, revealed to and through Jesus Christ to his apostles. As he said in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 15, So then, brothers, stand fast, stand firm, hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Saul believed that he received, he received authority for the evil things that he did from those that were in power. And we've heard of the Nuremberg trials. We've heard of all sorts of things where men do horrible, despicable things. And you ask them, they've said, I was told to do that. Paul was do, Saul was doing this same kind of thing. In, verse, in Acts 26 and 10, he said, And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I can imagine, I think of them when he's standing at, as Stephen was being stoned, and in, he condoned what was going on. He would cast his vote. He would uh, arrest the Christians and carry them back for trial, and some even leading to death. And we know that Christ through His Word is the sole source of authority for what we must do. In Matthew 28 and 18, Jesus said, All authority has been given on heaven and earth has been given to me. And then we, this well-quoted passage in Colossians 3 and 17, we say, Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And so we want to be like the Bereans. You remember how the Bereans, what they, how they were described in Acts 17 and 11? They searched the Scriptures daily to see if those things were so. Sometimes people ask, well, why, is that, why are you all so picky about what the Scriptures say? As Yell introduced our worship service today, and we are so glad you're all here and online, if you had a question about what we do and what we're, what we're doing, we'll... Right then, go to the Scripture and look at that. And somebody say, why, why, does, why, does that, why does that matter so much? Look at 1 Timothy 4 and 1. We'll read a few of these verses here. Just let it, we'll just see why is this so important. In 1 Timothy 4 1, Paul says, Now the Spirit expressly says, In latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. We've already talked about our conscience. But the reason that we have to be careful is because folks can and will depart from the truth. And we want, don't want to fall into that trap. And he goes on to say in verse 3, who forbid marriage, require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving to those who believe and know the truth. For everything is created by God is good, and nothing will be rejected if it's received in thanksgiving. And you know, there's you you can you can know you can probably know of some religions that forbid folks from marrying or have food um, abstinences and food policies. They don't eat certain kinds of food. And that doesn't mean that we just eat anything we pick up, like a the durian fruit or like you maybe don't like crawfish or lobsters or snake or alligator, or you might like it, you know, but, but some folks would have a religious aversion to that. He's, he, he talks about the kind of thing, making a distinction in fellowship based on what somebody eats. And verse 6, but if you put all these things 
before the brothers, you will be a good steward of Christ, Jesus being trained in the words of faith and the good doctrine that you've had. So he's telling Timothy that we, you need to pay attention and we need to pay attention and be trained in the words of faith. That's why we have so many Bible classes and why we look to God's words regularly, often. Verse 7, having nothing to do with irrelevant, silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness. And in verse 13, he goes on when he's talking to Timothy, and he says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. The elders here look for and design a Bible class programs for us all to edify us, to build us up, to make us stronger Christians. So, and we value and appreciate the public reading of Scripture. And in doing that, we're like the Bereans. And then look at uh, that final verse in six, verse 16 there. He says to Timothy, keep a close watch on yourself and on teaching, and some translations say doctrine, persist in this, for in doing so you'll save yourself and your hearers. So two things happen. We save ourselves and those that hear us. That's the reason we look to God's Word. And Jesus confronted the Jews because of their reliance, and actually they took advantage of the traditions. We talked about this in Bible class. The Jews would use those traditions to do anything that they wanted to. And they would justify what they did, even using some scriptures. So we want to be careful that we don't do that same thing. Number four, this blind man saw that he, he's not saved by prayer alone. Some folks falsely teach today. And if you travel much in, in uh, and you look in the nightstand by it, you're in the hotel, you might find a Bible there from the Gideons. And it's a, a probably American Standard or King James. Look at the back cover of that and see what it says there, and it'll be about praying the prayer of the sinner or something like that. And folks falsely teach today that we can be saved if we just believe and pray. But if we, if we carefully look at this these few passages from chapter Acts chapter 9, we'll see a couple of things. One, in Acts chapter 9 and 6, he was told, arise and enter the city, and you'll be told what you were to do. He already believed, and but he said, "Go, you need to do it more. And then verse 11, the Lord said to him, arise, go to the street called Straight. He was talking to Ananias and the house of Judas. Look for a man of Saul, uh, Tarsus, Saul, for behold, he's praying. So salvation hadn't happened yet. And then that passage we read, Acts 9, 18, immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight and then he arose and was baptized. Now Paul, in, when he was retelling this in Acts 22, in verse 16, he said, Why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name, calling on his name. So he, as he's tell, talking to others, he says, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized, wash away your sin, calling on his name. So in that sequence, we see that even if we're looking at Paul's personal experience, we see that believing wasn't enough, important, but not enough. Repenting was important, but not enough. Praying fervently was good, but not enough. And it was his salvation was culminated just as in Acts chapter 2 when he was baptized. The fifth thing is salvation is, he saw that salvation is a gift, yet requires some action on our part. That's quite a conundrum when we talk about salvation from works, through works, salvation by faith, by your faith. We, we read and read and study this, and it's a great uh, opportunity to study God's Word about that and understand that. And we can see that from James, from Acts. And despite that, some never do see what they must do to have their sins forgiven. And Acts 22 and 16, as we read, Now why do you wait? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sin, calling on His name. The Philippian jailers said in Acts 16.30, you remember that 
story, when he had heard the gospel, he said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? The message, therefore, since we look at this, is there's some actions required on our part. Faith, it requires faithful action. And it's put forth very well in Acts 2 and 38. And Peter said to them, and we're now in Acts 2, 38. Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and for your children, and who all are far off, everyone whom the Lord calls, God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation, or this crooked generation, some translations. So all that received the, his word were baptized, and there were added at that day about 3,000 souls. He saw that something, even the gift of God's grace, required an action on his part. One old preacher put it this way, it's that you're drowning in the ocean, and the the people in the boat throw you that buoy, that life buoy, that throw you a line. So salvation is there. It's within your grasp. But if you don't grab that, if you don't do what's required, and that is an action on your part, you'll drown, you'll be lost. Finally, this blind man saw that even the chiefest of sinners can be saved. I don't know the condition of everyone's heart this morning, but some may be thinking that they've committed some kind of sin that, that is, they're, they're just so far gone, they're too far gone, and they can never be saved. Not so. Look what Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 16. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, insolent opponent, I received mercy because I, acted, because I had acted ignorantly and in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Jesus Christ. This saying is trustworthy and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am. Some translations say the chiefest. Here it says, I am the foremost. None of us here today have done what Paul did, Saul did. Think about that. None of us have done that. Have any of us turned somebody into the police because they're a Christian? Has any of us stood and watched someone be stoned to death because of what they believe? None of us have done anything like that. None of us have so violently opposed Christ in his way that we would say to ourselves, we're the chiefest of sinners. And so... While there's mercy for Saul, for Paul, there's mercy for us. And he says in verse 16, I have received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost Christ might display his perfect presence, his perfect patience, as an example of those who are to believe in him for eternal life. You and I, those of us that have been baptized, those of us that are faithful Christians, serving God, we too, like Paul, we serve as an example to those who want to believe on him for eternal life. And we learned that no matter what we've done, he learned that no matter what he did, he could be saved. Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to salvation for all who believe, the Jew first and to the Greek. Just as we think about Acts chapter 9, we can... Maybe look at it from that perspective of what did he see? What did he learn? What did he find out on that road to Damascus? And we see these five things. And do you see what the blind man saw? That's our lesson for today. Maybe some that are ready to name Christ in salvation. Maybe you need the prayers of the church. If there's anything we can do for you, come while we stand and sing.